If we have Gomi races today, it is thanks to the Caribbean Indians. Blaise Bolver is a sailing enthusiast with a passion for Gomier boat regattas. Gomier is an undisputed tradition in Martinique, a true racing boat. Blaise attends boat regattas as part of the annual championship. In order to win, you need an excellent boat, a strong spirit, and a united team. Here is the crew. This is Hugh Desmer, a sailor and fisherman. I'm Blaise Bolver, an electrician. And this is uh, Badlou. And Alphonse, also sailor and fisherman. We will embark with Blaise Bulver upon a journey into time and space across the Caribbean to rediscover the origins of these boats and to tell the extraordinary story which took place in this region. These phenomenalists from Martinique managed to ensure the fragile balance of a boat which is in fact a boat of legend. The racing Gomier boat is but a modern version of the Caribbean pirogue, a boat with immemorial origins, the last witness of a sea epic almost a thousand years old. Look carefully at these boats. Their hulls are hollowed out directly from tree trunks. These are true sailing pirogues. Welcome. Gomier regattas play an important role in Martinique society, particularly in sports and leisure. The aim is for this tradition to live on in our children and grandchildren. We are currently the only country to organize this kind of regatta every Sunday. Some of the participants are not fishermen. They have never even fished in their lives, and yet they make good sailors. Some are taxi drivers and spend all week behind a steering wheel, and so on Sundays they are more than happy to board a gommier. They're good sailors too. It's not difficult, you know. You just need a lot of enthusiasm. The gommier, or pirogue, it's a tree which is cut down and hollowed out to give it the shape we know. Mm. 
The gommier boat is named after the French word for gum tree, out of which these pirogues are made. Today, gommiers are no longer built for fishing, only for competitive sport, and the boats are bigger, more streamlined, and have much larger sails. As his passion for regattas has remained intact, Emil Largen is a racing gommier manufacturer, as well as the founder of a sailing school for the youth of this community. With what do we balance the boat? The high rain controls the balance, and the low rain? What's the low rain for? The strength of the wind and the speed, the accelerator and the balance. So for the moment, you're going to get the boat to go as fast as possible. But if we go quickly, it won't be steady. The brake is the lower rain. First and foremost, I'm a physical education teacher, and I'm trying to get traditional sport into the curriculum. If we like it or not, we've got the best regatta gommiers, and when the children see the grown-ups sailing, they want to do it too. For example, in that gommier there, I have lots of my nephews and even some children. It's the passing down of our natural heritage from father to son. Gaëtan Petito knows more about gommiers than anyone else at the regatta, and he remembers the times when Martinique used to live to the rhythm of the gommiers. When you say gommier, it's not a word I like to use. I prefer the term dugout. Because when I say dugout, I mean something that's known in the whole of the Caribbean, not just in the French West Indies. A dugout's a piece of wood out of which you dig out the dugout. In the past, it meant everything to Martinicans. Weddings, births, death, work. So I don't like it when I hear you say fishing, because the gommier is not just limited to fishing and transport. It's everything, really everything. We wouldn't be able to live in Martinique if we didn't have the gommier. Gum trees are no longer felled in Martinique. Their scarcity has meant that gum wood is now imported from the neighboring islands of St. Lucia and Dominica. Gommier boat building is a disappearing art. Swim, Blaze, swim. 75 to 100 years for a tree to be right. If you cut it down when it's 50 years old and cook it, nine times out of ten it won't work. Now I can see you coming. I can see you're going to ask me, how do you know how old a tree is? That's a secret. Transmitted between us elders, I can't tell you. For the masts and sail, I need a tree trunk about 9 meters high with a diameter of about 12 to 14 centimeters. On the outskirts of the forest, I find a tree with the right dimensions. Through experience, I can tell that the wood is too young, so I leave it and carry on walking. Further on, I see a trunk about 14 centimeters in diameter and about 9 meters high, and know that this one's perfect. So you see a tree's dimension has nothing to do with its age. Il y 
Something you could ask me is why I'm using this branch to push us down the river. You saw us row up river to sell our sea produce in exchange for vegetables, but now we're tired. So I'm using this mangrove branch to push our way back. I've told you about wooden dugouts, so now I must tell you about gourds. A gourd cut in half is called a coui. It's an essential item for traditional sailors and fishermen. You know, after 10 or 20 years, a boat's hull is worn out. For the skipper always sits in the same place, so does his crew. So the hull always wears out in the same spot. The word cui refers to a gourd sliced in half and used as a baler. It comes, like many other words, in the Creole language from the Caribbean. In 1667, the Reverend Dutertre noted the use of this word by locals in his history of the French West Indies. The Caribbean Indians were natives of various regions of the Amazon and the Orinoco Delta. Being excellent sailors, in the 14th century, they colonized the small isles of the West Indies by sailing from one island to the next in tiny pirogues. The Spanish rulers and chroniclers were the first to come into contact with the Caribbean Indians, but unfortunately they left very little information on Indian culture and way of life but their clothes, their houses, and their hollowed pirogues leave no doubt of their origins. In the 17th century, the French, shortly followed by the English, encountered the Caribbean Indians. But their contact at the time was slight. It was not until 1620 that a group of French, unfortunate victims of piracy, were welcomed by the Indians of Martinique. One member of the group spent 11 months in their company. His anonymous account of this experience is the oldest testimony of life in the Caribbean. The original manuscript of this 17th century travel journal can be found in the French town of Carpentras and gives a vivid description of life at the time. The scenery is mountainous and the forest so dense that one dares not enter. Along the shore are huge boulders that act like ramparts, preventing one from walking from one village to the next. This is why our Indians have resorted to passing by the sea in either large boats they call canobes or smaller ones they call kohala. They propel the boat with a single oar they call an aboku. The man heads off alone into the mountains to find a suitable tree. When the location of the chosen tree is far from the village, at least a day's walk away, and aware that the tree trunk will take a certain time to cut through, the Indian takes a cotton bed with him to sleep on. 
he will then only return to his village once he has cut down his chosen tree. Sometimes he stays as long as a week, and not only does he have the tree to cut, but he also needs to clear a space onto which the tree can fall. Once the tree is down, he returns to his village. After a short period, the same man returns to the place in the mountains with five or six Indians to help him hollow out and burn his pirogue. Sometimes they stay as much as three weeks. And when they have cut away all but five or six days' worth of work, they go back and get more men to help drag the tree boat to the water's edge, where the finishing touches will be carried out. Little by little, they clear a path for the pirogue to pass over and lay down logs upon which the boat can roll. They accomplish the task with such strength, agility and dexterity that it is almost impossible to imagine that so huge a load has passed through such an awkward place. If you look closer, a few centuries later, there are still places in the Caribbean region where nothing has changed. Cunayala, the Cuna Indians' territory off Panama, here time seems to have had no influence on man. The sand glass of civilization stopped there when the Caribbean Indians landed on the archipelago. In Cuna Indian territory, everything seems as it was before. Natives live in houses built on the edge of the water to the rhythm of the pirogues, to the rhythm of the Caribbean Indians. Here, the pirogue is everything. Like their ancestors, they preserve a political system based on direct democracy. Even today, the Kuna Congress, in which each island is represented, watches over the Yunayala, the Kuna land. Nothing can be done without their agreement. Most decisions are made collectively. The traditional leaders, the Silas, are wise men, chosen for their learning. They deal with all questions relating to the division of land, family disputes, marriage, Muchas veces estamos organizados en forma muy democrática para tratar tierras familiares, individuales, comunales, y nosotros nunca nos peleamos. Tres caciques generales gobiernan el pueblo cuna, porque nosotros estamos cuidando todos los relacionados al 
al medio ambiente, porque nosotros tenemos que cuidar nuestros mares, nuestros campos, nuestros ríos, porque eso está prohibido por los caciques a maltratar a, los, a, a varias cosas que nosotros tenemos y conservamos desde nuestra tradición. Blaise rediscovers a culture long forgotten by his own people. The pirog, the dugout, it's a technique of the Indians. They brought this technique over to us. If our grandfathers were here, they'd be happy to see us make the pirog this way. <laughs> Kuna society is mostly matriarchal. Women hold the right of inheritance regarding possessions and names. Women take care of all domestic tasks, but they are involved in every other important matter, and they often get their way. Women still make their own clothes and the pearl bracelets worn on their ankles and arms. These are the most prestigious indications of their culture and because of this are dearly cherished. If in the past marriages were arranged by the bride's family, today the young Kuna girl chooses her own husband. The most reliable way of seduction for a Kuna girl is to kidnap her sweetheart. The man has to live with his wife's family, so she simply sends the men in her family over to abduct her future husband while she waits, shyly hiding behind a veil, until they deposit him in her hammock. She then goes and joins him. After a brief ritual, the couple is left alone. And in general, this concludes the engagement. <laughs> Pirogues are important links between these small and overpopulated islands. Everyone has one, either large or small, from an early age. In everyday life, they are used as a means of traveling between communities, moving around the forest, for farming a small patch of land, collecting firewood, or for fishing on the other side of the reef. Pirogues can also be found in the various ceremonies that punctuate Kuna life. Through a slit cut in a hammock, a newborn slips into a pirogue full of water. A pirogue will also carry a Kuna Indian on his final trip back to the mainland, right up to his grave. A miniature pirogue is even placed on the tomb so that the soul of the dead can travel the waters of paradise. The inhabitable islands are few and overpopulated. Fields are therefore on the mainland a few paddle strokes away. A patch of land belongs to the person who clears it. Likewise, the sea to the person who chooses to fish on it. Everyone is free to do as they please, growing and trading corn, manioc, plantain bananas, and pineapples. Each island community has a collective plantation where men go and cultivate what doesn't grow on their own land. That's how they preserve a true polyculture for every family. But too often today, men don't want to grow anything else except coconuts. Money has now begun to enter the system, largely as a result of selling coconuts to passing Colombian coastal boats. The profits are large, but the risks are great, for the market fluctuates a lot. For centuries, the Kuna language existed only in oral form. It was not until the 20th century that it began to be written in the Roman alphabet. Even today, a large majority of Kuna don't know how to write their own language. A secret language also exists, based on ideograms learnt by village elders. In fact, this language is the singing of long mythological stories.
Caribbean people like the Kuna Indians have, however, managed to protect most of their traditions from external threats through their fierce determination and organization since white men arrived. The white men brought them sails, they quickly adapted on their pirogues, as well as other progress more insidious and dangerous. The Caribbean Indians still numbered about 10,000 at the beginning of the 17th century. In only two generations, most of their traditions were crushed by colonization and the subsequent intermixing of races. A few small isolated groups of Indians can still be found on some islands, in particular on Dominica, where there are around 150 people of old Caribbean stock. South of Guadeloupe, an archipelago known as the Saints forms a rather curious maritime exception in all the French West Indies. In the 17th century, the white men in Guadeloupe were setting up a number of plantations, importing thousands of black slaves from Africa to work the land. Some of them tried to set up the same plantations on the Saints. A terribly dry climate and severe water shortage meant it was a complete failure, forcing the people to turn to the sea to make their living. The people from the Saints soon earned the reputation of being the best fishermen in the French West Indies. Their traditional sailing craft, and later the motor ones, are used by all of Guadeloupe and beyond. Today that magnificent boat is no longer used for fishing. Fishermen prefer to use plastic dinghies with outboard motors. And once again, those who have a passion for these boats have saved the other survivor of the Caribbean tradition. Pa, 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 pa,
Ce sont les deux meilleures équipes, hein? Ouais, ouais. Les autres, moi, sont là, mais ce sont les deux meilleures équipes. Le Lyon comme Capelli! Le Lyon comme Capelli! Le Lyon comme Capelli! Another boating tradition is one belonging to the Whites. It's the Santoise boat, originating from either Normandy or Brittany. The gommier and the pirogue are dugouts, hollowed out from a trunk of wood. The Santoise boat is different. It's different because it's a structure which is built around which we build the shape. This is just like the old Saint-Ouas boats of the past. The hull was very different from this one. You see it's rounded and the inside was not the same. That one's in a V-shape, and this is quite curved. A while ago they used this one for fishing. It's a sailing Santoise, yes, a sailing one, but you can put an engine on it. Even with a keel? No, without a keel. When we went fishing with the old sailing boats, we would catch about two or three sea breams. We would sell them and earn money. But today, with these boats, we don't earn anything from two or three sea breams. It just about pays the petrol. That's not what I call progress. No. Fishing has come on a lot since the introduction of outboard engines. Today, working conditions are much better, but we've lost the traditional aspect. Can you remember the size of the biggest fish you've caught? Oh, it weighed about 35 kilos. What's the biggest change of today? In the past, there were a lot more rock lobsters. We would catch them just off the shore. We would fill whole boats of them and hardly know what to do with them all. At what distance would the shoals of fish be offshore? Really near. But now we have to go right out to sea. Diving has ruined everything. The truth is, the seabed of the saints has become very poor. The best fishermen have overexploited it too much, and they have to turn themselves now to other activities. From 9 until 4, the two main islands belong to the tourists. And so the Saint-Trois people have turned from fishing to running restaurants, hotels, souvenir shops, boutiques, and the hiring of scooters. Some people even offer bed and breakfast. The Saint-Trois people seem to get so much out of tourism that one wonders how this small group, which clung on to its territory for almost 400 years, has managed to keep its identity. However, when the last pleasure boats return to Guadeloupe in the evening, the islands again regain their tranquility until the next morning. The Santois people once again have their islands to themselves.
Fishing's my trade, but if someone offered me another job, I'd do it. Right, so you could be a builder? You know how to do something else apart from fishing? Yes, if it means earning money, we can only sell the big fish like sea bream to the hotels and tourists. The Santois people have no choice. Net fishing close to the coasts is now impossible, and open sea fishing requires plastic dinghies with powerful engines. A few fishermen are willing to pay the price, even at the cost of their own health. These motorized plastic hulls will ruin young fishermen. When they're 40, they won't be able to go out to sea. They'll have compressed spinal columns. Like me, look at my belt. Even so, you continue? Oh yes, you have to. Anyway, fish are the love of my life. In Santois land, a custom is slowly dying. But the tradition of the fishing pirogue is still very vivid in another part of the Caribbean, Haiti. Haiti, formerly Hispaniola, discovered by Christopher Columbus, was the first island to be colonized in 1492 and to win its independence in 1804. However, since then, the country has been chronically unstable, ravaged by military coups, civil wars, and infinite political problems. Haiti, once so rich, is now one of the poorest countries in the world. Fishing has remained a craft, and its techniques are almost archaic. Haiti was once full of beautiful forests of cedar and gum trees. Sadly, these forests were overexploited by the inhabitants, and today they have almost completely disappeared. Now Haitian fishermen, being too poor to afford modern hulls, have to make do with palm leaves. Here, everybody has to be resourceful. There's a large part at the back that's damaged, so he had to cut that piece off. This is it here. He'll put in a new piece. He's put some hemp in it to make it watertight, as they don't have putty like us. He stuck it in with cement. And does it work? It's rudimentary. He makes do with what he's got. He goes out to sea in that, yet I think it's too small. But he has his techniques and he's a real sailor, so he knows what he's doing. A Haitian fisherman's life hangs by a thread. They're in the middle of setting up a three-hoop net. Here, we've got big stitches in the center, middle-sized ones, and on the other side, even bigger stitches. All this is made by the fishermen themselves. It's a net that means they can catch big and middle-sized fish, but not small ones as they pass through. They catch turtles, ray, goldfish, sharks, and also rock lobsters.
This is rock lobster paradise. When the wind blows from the north, the sea rises. We have many more lobsters today than usual. In a week, you can easily catch 3,000 pounds of rock lobsters. You don't even have to go very far out to sea. In Martinique, we always used to fish with bamboo hoop nets. We would bring back many more fish than with the wire hoop nets of today. I export rock lobsters to Martinique and Guadeloupe. Today I have 900 kilo load for Guadeloupe. It's for the local market? No, no, the local market doesn't buy rock lobsters, as there are no tourists. It really is rock lobster paradise. If we had the money, we'd buy more hoop nets. But if you supply the commercial market, like in Martinique, you have to go even further. Blaise feels at home here. The sailing techniques are familiar to him, even though surprisingly rustic. The Haitian fishermen speak a language he knows, Creole. It originated from a mixed people's need to communicate, a combination of African slaves and the last of the Caribbean Indians. It's market day on Cows Island and also a public holiday known as King's Thursday. Haitians come from the surrounding islands and islets. That day, all the boats invented by the Caribbean can be seen. There are no plastic dinghies or outboard motors on these islands off Haiti, only boats with pitiful sails made of recycled canvas or plastic. But they will have to do for a few more decades in this resourceful land. Let's 
marché à plus pas bon. Si tu pas vendre 120 dollars pour me quitter. 120 dollars pour me dire. Je ne vais pas, monsieur, je ne vais pas. 120 dollars. The island of Kayalo could be mistaken for paradise on earth with its coconut trees and long stretches of white sand. Drinking water can even be found just by digging into the sand. But this is just the surface beauty. For although fish are plentiful, with more than enough for the island's inhabitants, the price of rock lobster and fish is so low that almost no profit is made. Life is hard, and apart from daily rounds of dominoes, there is nothing to do. I was about the same age as them, six. We'd make them out of wood we called everlasting. We'd make a dugout, a gommier, and I'd put a knife in the bottom to make a keel. And every time my mother would leave a skirt hanging around, I'd tear off a bit of it for a sail. When she would come back, she'd ask who'd torn her skirt. I wouldn't say a word. It was no one. Quand elle revenait et puis elle voyait la jupe, elle demandait qui c'est qui l'avait déchiré. C'était jamais personne, je ne répondais jamais. Modernism, intensive fishing and motorization have eliminated men, almost ruined the seabed and wiped out Saint-Trois boats from this planet. There are still paradises for fishermen, Let's hope for once these people will soon become aware of the fragility of their environment. And for the moment, as for their catch, Blaze can't believe his eyes. They're fishing for bonitas. It's a fish that's normally found a few kilometers from the shore. We're less than 10 meters from the shore, and look at this. When I tell them in Martinique that I've seen bonitas being caught five meters from the beach, they'll say I'm lying. 